Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And thank you again uh, to Mark Isselhart. Mark Isselhart has been busy answering questions from the comfort of his car um, mm -hmm. in the Q&A box. Uh, Mark Canella, you have a couple in there. While oh, yeah. Mark Canella is getting oriented to his questions, Mark uh, Isselhart, any, any of the questions and answers you wanted to highlight for us? Uh, yeah, I can do a quick, if people haven't seen them, um, I'm happy to, to uh, just do a quick overview. So the, the, the question uh, from, from, I think it was Juan asking about uh, possible future opportunities for tapping other species. There are companies doing it now and even at scale. There's a company, Forest Farmers, that has a big footprint in New York as well as in Marshfield, Vermont. They're tapping beech trees, they're tapping birch trees. Um, it's, it's a little bit of the Wild West. There really aren't any um, standards for what those products are. There, there's over a hundred years of <laughs> standards for what maple is. And so, I don't know, Mark would be the one to answer this about consumer confusion. And, and if you're gonna be able to be able to build market for something, if people don't know what, if it's gonna be consistent every time they buy it. So um, there's definitely uh, opportunities there, Juan. And it's, um, there's a lot of work yet about maple that we don't know. So um, it's Abby Vandenberg has done a tremendous amount of work on birch and I would urge anyone interested in birch to check out all her work. Um, and if you're, if you're interested, so. Um, Matt, can I add something to that sure. one? Just that, that concept, um, I, I think this is the concept of a niche upon a niche upon a niche. Um, it's definitely feasible for other tree syrups and it's exciting. I think it's good to, to back it out and say that maple syrup is already a niche specialty sweetener amongst a whole host of global sweeteners. So we're already a very small fraction of the, the, the market for sweeteners, but we're also highly targeted towards a certain type of flavor or a certain type of customer. Now, when you start breaking it up into novel tree syrups, you're, you're like the niche of the niche, right? It's going to be more expensive, probably more unique. And this is this great dynamic in the business world where I think a few go-getters are probably going to make businesses happen. I think the question from an extension mindset for me is, is this a replicable model? Is this something that not, not the 1% of entrepreneurs are going to be able to figure out? Is this, is this something that's going to resonate with a broader producer audience? And I think there's, I think to be determined, but it's just like the niche stacking that I, I usually put that in context to kind of think about at least programming wise, where are my beneficiaries and how much of this is going to be research-based versus passion-based? And uh, I think that's relevant from a programming side. Just to put a number to what Mark is saying, the last estimate was that maple was maybe one to 2% of all the pourable sweetener market in the world. So it's really, really small. Even though since we're so enmeshed in it in Vermont and the Northeast, it's probably much higher here, but elsewhere, there are a lot of people in the world. So um, do you want me to run to Jeff's question next or? Yes. So please. Jeff, I was asking what percent crown release is recommended for sugar bush thinning uh, to maintain best tree health. So in general, <clears throat> sugar maple is considered, uh, it's really good at compartmentalizing wounds, but it can be a little delicate in terms of release and management. So we generally don't want to see more than 50% of the crown released at one time. So you want to release that maybe one or two of the quarters of the crown and let the, team, the tree recover. There's issues of wind throw. You know, if you grow up used to having support from your neighbors and all of a sudden you take all of them out, it can be a real issue with wind throw, fine root damage, sun scald, all those things. So it doesn't always get done that way, but that's the recommendations. Um, and then- I, So cr crown release is, is basically thinning. It's it is. taking some down so that others can grow. If a forest is a competition for water, light and nutrients, you're, you're favoring a certain crop tree in one of those areas for sure. Yep. Um, I saw Leslie had a question too um, about, you know, what percentage of uh, Vermont sugar makers uh, suspect using the correct tapping. Well, if you took the data from our survey, you'd, you'd think that maybe 75% hit 4% or less stained wood. Um, I, think, I think without actually measuring it carefully, over a large number of trees, it's hard to really know what you're hitting. Um, at Proctor, 
when we actually sat down and measured each tree, not the weight to the degree I did in this experiment, but just a check mark every time you hit brown wood, we were close to 10%. And then through better management practices, slowing down a little bit on tapping, reducing the number of taps per tree, we've got that number now to 1% or less, so. Great. Um, Mark Canella, looks like you're answering one of the questions about uh, small, small sugar farmers co-op opportunities. Yeah, I can, I, I can talk faster than I can type. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, we're seeing a small uh, a number of co-ops forming, and this is not a surprise. I think this is an expectation as the market grows and as a, a large number of smaller producers are trying to figure out how to um, promote their product and build a, build a customer base and to compete with the established dis distributors that um, are efficient and pretty, you know, I think high quality, but also low cost. So we're going to see co-ops. This is one of the reasons we also are looking specifically at partnerships and legal instruments programmatically, as we know that co-ops are kind of complex governance structures for a number of people. Um, we know that a lot of maple producers are starting to form partnerships with nearby neighbors, like landowners partnering with operators or, um, you know, someone who's got the capital but doesn't have the skill set. So we kind of are starting with the partnership and um, entity formation. I'm assuming that in three or four years, we'll probably be doing a little bit more work with cooperative development once a few of these grow or gets a little more traction. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a neat, it's, it's exciting to see these evolution in, in business structures with the industry that's taking, taken off. And Mark, see, so you had another question in there, I think, uh, regarding land transition. Read this out. Yeah, is land transition as much a problem for sugar producers who age out or as it is for other types of food producers? Um, well, land's not getting any cheaper. So some of that context is, is still there. The next generation is going to be looking to buy in and the older generation is often trying to cash out classic neoclassical agricultural model. You, you don't make any money. No one had to tell you that, but you're paying your debt and you're going to sell your land when you get done. And so from a forestry perspective, it's not completely different. One of the things I've come across with um, older maple producers, and it is an older demographic, um, is food, the food safety investments actually that are, that are coming up. And a lot of, of the older operators are saying, thinking, hmm, I've got the land, I've got the business, but I don't know if I'm going to make the next investment in the food processing side of the sugaring because it's really expensive, a, a, a necessity of the future. Maybe I could start to partner or transition land to another generation or another um, younger business member, business partner that could operate and sort of take over the, um, the sugaring, the maple syrup part of the business. But these older landholders are thinking maybe they could still be active in the woods. And so that we're kind of seeing some different flex points on that concept of transfer and transition. Interesting. Um, there's also a question about the, the model of a dairy or diversif uh, you know, diversified vegetable operation also doing a thousand taps for, added, for value added um, mm -hmm. diversification. Uh, not viable on its own or, but, uh, but okay. how, how would you yeah, evaluate when, that? When, when we do, when we do our financial benchmarking, we, we do the, um, the really difficult thing. We, we put a time, we put a value on, on farm owners time and we, we evaluate the business from, from a profitability standpoint, assuming that the owner's at least making a, a, a minimal wage of, you know, 10 to $15 an hour in Maple. We actually benchmark at $18 an hour, um, for the owner operator. So we, we, we classify those costs and we allow people to have that conversation about, are they viable um, in the sense that this is a paying job or are they viable in the sense that they've got the capacity to volunteer part of their life to something that they feel really strongly about. And um, it's not really my job to tell them what to do, but I can at least give them the numbers so they can make that evaluation. So Hans, your question about the diversified pharma, I'm sure that there are 1000 tap operations out there that are financially viable. Um, but I also know that people will do things for different reasons. And I think that the important question from a, from a risk management mindset is if you're diversifying because you're trying to build resilience and risk, if your enterprise diversification isn't profitable, well, you're not, def you're definitely not, you know, um, accomplishing the financial resilience. You could actually be creating more problems. Um, and that has to be evaluated in combination to, you know, maybe physically and emotionally, you actually have to do something different 
for part of the year, and you are going to pursue an enterprise that's diversified from an activity level, um, you may or may not have financial goals from that. But um, I think generally working with uh, owners that have kind of a need for income, uh, we, we have some really sound conversations about it. Is diversification going to meet their expectations for what it is they're trying to accomplish and, and, and really go back and focus on their goals? Great. We had a couple of questions show up in the chat box as well. Um, Phil Lintelik is asking, can you outline the issues around adulterated maple? You want me to take that, Mark? Or you... Yeah, I think you should take that. Uh, it's a great question, Phil. And, and believe it or not, some of the early food safety laws that the FDA had, even before FSMA, were and partly significantly an outgrowth of maple adulteration. There was a huge amount of adulteration done 100 years ago and a little more, whereas essentially pure glucose and then some caramel color. Um, there have been issues in the more recent past with um, cutting the, the sugar with a cheaper product, but there is also testing that is done. You can do some uh, testing based on what the actual plant is that's producing that sugar. And you can find a ratio of carbon isotopes to, to figure out whether or not it came from a tree or a grass or you know what have you. We haven't seen a whole lot recently. There've been a few and it's kind of what you expect. If you see a five gallon pail of pure maple syrup for $20 on eBay, you know, <laughs> it's probably not pure maple syrup. Um, and, and there have been examples of that, but Phil, I don't think it's been too widely, too widely uh, an issue, but it is something at the international level that there is a cooperative between the U.S. and Canada to do testing, mostly complaint-driven. Um, Great. And there's another question from Chris Kaliba, I think. Um, can you speak to the future of harvesting maple saplings to stem the impacts of climate change? So Chris, I think you're asking about uh, cutting the tops off of small maple saplings and harvesting the sap. Um, that's a project really uh, that is Tim Perkins and Abby Vandenberg's project. I'm somewhat familiar, but the, the big issue with that is a commercially viable and affordable fitting to, to, make, that, to make that connection. Chris Callahan can certainly uh, appreciate the complexity of trying to put a vacuum tight seal on a natural thing like a tree stem, um, really challenging. I do know that Tim and Abby are working with some of the maple companies to develop such a product. And I do know that there's been producers who have put saplings in the ground. We know that the concept is possible. Um, I think we're probably several years away from seeing it actually adopted as a widespread practice. Great. As, as we wind down, I actually had one question for Mark Iselhart about the staining. It is what, what is happening chemically or physiologically there? What causes the staining? Is it oxidation? Or? Yeah, I mean, there are phenolic compounds that are produced by the tree. There, are, um, there is some oxidation that happens. Um, as, ro as, as mature as the CODIT model is, uh, the compartmentalization, there are some things we still don't understand, which is like the timing of how quickly it happens. Um, you know, we use dissection of trees quite a bit to measure that staining and how Abby has done so much of that to look at the variability. But even then it's after a whole growing season. So we don't understand really what are the genetic triggers for being good or bad you know, air quotes, good or bad at being compartmentalizing. Um, so there's, and, and part of it has to do with the timing. We're doing it during the dormant season. The wounds are happening in the dormant season. A lot of the work that's been done on wounding has been done during the growing season when the tree is much more rapid to respond to that injury. So it's, uh, it's tricky. Great. And we, we are uh, truly winding down on the hour. I want to thank Mark Canella and Mark Iselhart for joining us today and taking some time to introduce us all to the great work you're doing and um, the work that's happening uh, throughout Vermont in Maple. Um, I, I do want to just note that um, we had, uh, I, can't, I think it might have been Jeff who said it, um, just noting in the chat, sugaring is good for the soul of us small producers, even without profit. We love to spend money on new tubing and pans. 
smiley face. Thanks for all the support for the industry. So yeah, truly, thank you both very much. Appreciate the time. And thank you for everybody for, for joining and being so engaged with great questions. See you next time. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care.